This is going to be a short video on anticoagulant drugs. In general, we're going to be talking about commonly used blood thinners. Anticoagulant drugs are commonly called blood thinners that are used for treating venous thromboses. So let's jump right into it. We're first going to talk about warfarin. Warfarin is by far the oldest of the drugs that we're going to be talking about. Warfarin is an inhibitor of vitamin K regeneration. Vitamin K is required to make some coagulation factors, such as factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Uh, vitamin K is also required to make protein CNS, which have an anticoagulative effect on the coagulation cascade. And if you apply warfarin, you will inhibit vitamin K regeneration, which thus prevents the, the making of all of these coagulation factors and protein CNS. So vitamin K in the body, when it's used to make these factors, becomes a vitamin K epoxide. In order to regenerate vitamin K, we have an enzyme called vitamin K epoxide reductase. Warfarin, shown on the right here with those three rings, inhibits vitamin K epoxide reductase, which inhibits the regeneration of vitamin K, essentially causing an artificial vitamin K deficiency. So if we look at the coagulation cascade here, the circled uh, factors are the ones that are inhibited by warfarin. Um, the circle factors are also the ones that are uh, vitamin K dependent, meaning that if you don't have sufficient intake of vitamin K in your diet, or if it's not properly synthesized by your gut bacteria, since your gut bacteria does make some vitamin K, uh, you will have uh, these deficiencies in the coagulation cascade. So these circled ones, the ones that are circled in red, are directly affected by, or not maybe, maybe not directly affected, but they're certainly uh, affected by warfarin. In addition, warfarin also requires bridging to use. Warfarin blocks uh, this list of, of coagulation factors again. And of these coagulation factors, protein C is the one that runs out first. It's the one that is, uh, has a, like a short half-life and has a short concentration in the plasma. And those combined make protein C run out first. If protein C runs out, if we can go back to this... Um, we can go back to this, to this schematic. We see protein C down here has an inhibitory effect on the coagulation cascade. If protein C runs out, that means that we're going to have an inhibition of an anticoagulant protein, meaning that we're going to have an increased coagulative effect. So the reason that we want bridging, as we see written here, is because warfarin has, paradoxically has a coagulative effect at first. So this means that for the first four or five days of using warfarin, we also want to combine it with another coagulant, like any other drugs, any of the other drugs that we're going to be causing or that we're going to be talking about here. If you don't use warfarin with bridging, you're going to have uh, skin necroses. It's going to cause uh, some some clotting in the microvasculature, especially in the fat tissue, and it'll present as dead skin. Um, often on the breast, often on the thighs, sometimes on the butt, uh, where, where, where there's fat on the body, and it can cause that tissue to die. One of the main advantages of warfarin is that it can be taken orally, and its effect usually requires a few days to start up, since you are inhibiting the production of these coagulation factors. Uh, unlike heparin and some of the other drugs that we're, going to that we're going to be talking about, you don't directly inhibit them. So when you apply warfarin, the body still has some stores of all these coagulation factors, and uh, it takes until the body runs out for warfarin to take effect. One last thing to note is that warfarin is certainly not compatible with pregnancy, and it can cause birth defects. Next, we're going to be talking about heparin. Now, heparin is a carbohydrate. It's incredibly negatively charged, uh, and it's it's littered with sulfate groups. There are sulfate groups all over this carbohydrate. Heparin binds directly to a protein called antithrombin. Antithrombin and heparin together bind thrombin and bind coagulation factor 10A. Now, Heparin or antithrombin works without heparin, but heparin enhances the, the, the effects of antithrombin by a factor of 10,000. So if we see antithrombin circled uh, toward the right of this diagram here, we can see antithrombin has an inhibitory effect on factor 10A production. So X, that's 10, being made into 10A. Uh, and antithrombin also obviously has an effect on thrombin, which is 2A right below there. 
if we add heparin, as shown, um, just flew in, that'll increase the effects of antithrombin 10,000 fold. And that's, that's quite a big difference. And that's made heparin a pretty popular drug. So heparin has five sugars of its long carbohydrate chain that bind to antithrombin. And if you have 18 sugars within a heparin, that's long enough to inhibit thrombin. So heparin alone with five sugars can bind to antithrombin, which has an inhibitory effect on 10A. If you have 18 sugars, you can inhibit thrombin by forming a heparin, antithrombin, and thrombin complex. Heparin is a, is a polymer and it kind of acts like a long chain that, that kind of hugs antithrombin and thrombin together. In order to uh, kind of monitor how much heparin is in the body, you can, you can watch it with anti-10A levels, which is an assay done in the body. Uh, it's coagulation factor XA, uh, activity that is measured based on the, the reaction 10 to 10A and how much that reaction rate is decreased when you add heparin, when you add the patient plasma containing heparin uh, to that reaction. You can also monitor heparin with the PTT blood coagulative assay, and that's worth, that's worth knowing as well. The antidote for heparin is a positively charged molecule called protamine sulfate and heparin must be administered subcutaneously, but its effects do happen pretty quickly, much faster than warfarin. Next, we have two smaller versions of heparin. The first is low molecular weight heparin, also called enoxaparin. This is a polymer that's about one third the size of heparin, and it cannot complex with antithrombin. It's not the 18 sugars long that is required to form that hug between antithrombin and thrombin. So enoxaparin uh, it does work to inhibit factor 10A. It does not work to inhibit thrombin. So again, you can measure enoxaparin effectiveness with the anti-10A test. And enoxaparin is particularly used when you have an embolism that is associated with cancer. And cancer puts you at a pretty high risk for getting a DVT or a PE. And enoxaparin can be used in that situation. Next drug that we have here is Fondaparinux, or Fondaparino, which is called tiny heparin, or I just call it tiny heparin. Tiny heparin is essentially just the five sugars required to bind to antithrombin. Once again, this smaller version of heparin cannot form a complex with antithrombin to inhibit thrombin, but it can activate antithrombin enough to affect coagulation factor 10A. And again, we use the anti-10A test to measure that difference. Fondaparinox is actually synthetically made. The other heparin molecules are, uh, are, are, are produced from animal extracts, usually from the intestines of, of pigs, maybe cows. Uh, so fondaparinox does not induce heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, unlike enoxaparin and unfractionated heparin. Next, we have a class of drugs called new oral anticoagulants, uh, known as NOACs for short. NOACs are uh, particularly advantageous because they've been shown to, sh to, to cause fewer intracranial bleeds. Um, but one, one drawback is that you cannot use these drugs with people who have mechanical heart valves. Um, literature has shown that that, does, that that is not effective. You want to use warfarin or heparin instead. So two of these drugs are Revoxaban and Apixaban. And these two, uh, these two drugs have an inhibitory effect on factor 10A again, and they're both metabolized in the liver. We also have dabigatran, which directly inhibits thrombin. Unlike the, uh, the heparins that we saw, or un unlike unfractionated heparin that we saw, that had an indirect effect on thrombin, dabigatran is a direct thrombin inhibitor, and, dab and dabigatran is cleared through the kidneys. And lastly, we have argatroban. Argatroban is also a direct thrombin inhibitor, meaning that it binds directly to thrombin to inhibit it. Uh, this, unlike heparin, means that there's no need for antithrombin, and arg or argatroban actually, or actually affects all three coagulation tests. So you get prolonged results on the TT, the PT, 
and the PTT. Argatroban is particularly useful in cases of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, where you cannot use heparin, enoxaparin, or fondaparinu. And lastly, argatroban is uh, slightly unique in that it's metabolized or metabolized and, 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 uh, and broken down in the liver, unlike some of the other drugs that we talked about on this list. And that's all we have for today. Thanks for listening.